So first and foremost, uh, homework, homework. Uh, it should be released right now. Uh, I'm not sure if the grade scope was quite timed correctly, uh, but I'll check it after class to make sure that it's there. Uh, it is on the FCC, but I want to point out the next bullet, which is that, or the next half of that, which is uh, wait till tomorrow um, to actually try to attempt it. Uh, if you have experienced Jupyter Notebooks before, feel free to go ahead and get started. If you, but you'll need Jupyter Notebook experience, FCC experience, uh, et cetera. So my recommendation would be wait till tomorrow once we do the discussion section where we'll introduce you to all of that. Um, and homework one should be full enough that it shouldn't have too much of an impact on your ability to complete it by next Thursday. Uh, any questions? All right. Uh, I really, yeah. I remember you mentioned like sending in, sending in the homework early to get extra credit. Yeah, so you can turn the the homework in early for extra credit. Uh, easy for me to say. Uh, if you turn it in by Tuesday's class, I can't remember if it's like Tuesday at three thirty or if it's Tuesday end of day. Grade scope will tell you theoretically. Um, any other questions? All right, so we'll, let's see, raise your hand if you think that there will be a Piazza question later today about how to access the homework. 100%, no question. All right, next. Uh, this is kind of like a little, like uh, there's actually a, a number of things in this particular lecture, which we're gonna, I'm gonna mention and talk about, but is gonna be a little, I probably a little hard to follow without context. Don't worry about it too much, um, it's kind of like, here's your first pass at it, and then we're going to talk about it again, and then we'll talk about it again, and then we'll keep talking about it probably throughout the rest of the semester. So if you don't kind of catch all the details in class today, uh, don't worry about it. Like, like if we will revisit it or come by office hours if you really feel like you missed something. Um, but it is, it is going to be a bit of a whirlwind, so I just want to kind of warn you, but literally everything we talk about, we will talk about again. Uh, so it shouldn't be too big a deal. Do you have a question? Okay. Um, so this one is when we're doing uh, these these uh, homeworks and labs that you're going to do, you're using this tool called Jupyter Notebook. You're going to see it some more. I showed it to you in the first lecture. Um, but at the very end of it, they tell you to use this grader.export to uh, submit your homework. Uh, that doesn't work because I haven't figured out a way to fix it yet. Uh, one day, maybe I will. Um, so what you'll do instead is actually save your work, then just download the file and upload it to Gradescope and everything will be fine. So just keep that in mind. I have run it many, many times by accident. It doesn't hurt anything. It's just gonna give you a nasty error and not do anything useful. Okay, so just keep in mind, you will have to download it and then upload it into Gradescope. But it's pretty straightforward. Um, as I said a couple of times, please try not to sit there or kind of in that back right corner if you get here on time uh, so that anybody who's running late uh, doesn't have to interrupt the class trying to find a seat. Um, if you are, let's, I refer to myself as a nerd on the regular. If you're a nerd or want to be a nerd, uh, there is this uh, Tech Club Splash. Um, I think it has like six different names like today, but it is on Sunday. Um, it is in the new building, which you may have seen, it's kind of like big daddy, um, and uh, in the lobby. But basically, all the clubs on campus that are kind of tech related uh, will like have booths, and so you can kind of check them out and see if there's any that are interesting. Um, they often will run demos, sometimes they have swag, uh, so dropping by is not a bad thing. Uh, if they do have swag, though, I would recommend dropping by at 115 and not at 345 if you want the swag. All right. Any questions? All right. Uh, so I usually will have some announcements kind of at the beginning of class. They're normally at the last slide, too. And if I remember, I'll get to it and kind of leave it up there in case you want it. Um, but then we also try to post all the slides before the end of the day. So you should have access to it anyway. All right. So uh, this is just kind of a little bit of a recap, but also kind of the stuff I didn't quite get to last lecture. Uh, so just keep in mind, a randomized controlled experiment is something you're gonna have to know what that is, okay? But basically it's just when you are creating an experiment, okay? So in other words, you have, you know, two things you wanna test, right? Whether chocolate consumption helps with, um, you know, heart health or not, that's an experiment, right? 
um, and when you define your groups using random randomness, okay, uh, you can do it in a lot of different ways. Um, has anybody here, uh, you know, kind of been on a team in school, right, where the, you count off between one and ten, let's say, so you get ten different teams? That is a randomized kind of controlled experiment, right? Um, it's a little bit interesting. Does anybody know why people use that count off technique instead of saying like this block or that block? Any ideas? People sit with their friends, right? So it breaks up groups. Um, so if you want people to get to know each other, it's often better to introduce that random element that separates people who are likely to sit together. Um, so now I've taken into it, whenever I go to something like this, I sit next to the people I like the least. That was a joke, why? All right. Um, and so basically what you wanna be able to get back to is that you can kind of prove that the groups are distributed randomly. Okay, whatever way you want to be able to do that, uh, usually it's mathematical. All right. Um, and then one thing I like to point out. Um, so if you look up random in the dictionary, uh, usually it means haphazard, but that's not what it is. Okay, it is not haphazard. It is very carefully randomized. Okay. In other words, haphazard really means more like it's just arbitrary. Whereas this is, we are carefully randomizing this. And then because I didn't get to leave the XKCD up long enough, uh, one of the other classes I teach, I actually have a whole slide of, um, if you want to be in the tech world, uh, pop culture references that you should be aware of, okay? XKCD is one of them. Uh, it is usually quite funny if you are a nerd. Um, sometimes it is not funny, even if you are a nerd. Um, but they're often very amusing. Um, and then another one is, has anybody seen the movie Glenn Gary? I can never say it. Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. Okay, it's very old. There's a very famous scene in there about, um, about selling uh, that is quoted all the time. Another movie is um, uh, Office Space. Has anybody ever seen that? There's a great scene about how you feel about printers in that movie. Do you remember the scene I'm talking about? They go out to the field with the printer. Yeah, all right. Uh, so definitely recommended, also referenced a lot, Douglas Adams, uh, an author of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. This is why you should always have a towel. Uh, these are references that you should know, all right? Does anybody know why 42 comes up a lot in tech? You know the number 42? Meaning. It's, it's the meaning of life, the universe, and everything. The problem is no one knows what the question is. Um, and apparently mice are actually involved in trying to discover the answer. So those are some random references for you. Uh, I definitely recommend checking those things out um, because they are not only funny, but they'll also uh, help you understand. Like, as I told you before, a lot of tech uses a lot of wordplay uh, to, you know, not only make jokes, but also to make points. Um, so, you know, so in lots of different ways. So if you know the backstory, sometimes it can make it a lot easier to understand. All right, so this is just another example. Um, so, for example, uh, this one is making it very clear um, that if you um, basically the amount of margarine you consume versus butter uh, is directly linked to divorce rate, right? And if you've ever had margarine, then you know why this is true. Um, but again, this is confounding factors, right? Is that this is just another example of no, these two things are unrelated, okay? They just happen to fall along with each other. So we might have an association here, we might have a correlation here, but it is certainly not causal, okay? Because we can't get rid of enough confounding factors to make this any sort of reasonably useful thing. All right, next up. Uh, so Python, very common programming language, okay? This is not the snake, okay? Um, this is a programming language. I actually don't know why it's called Python. It's one of those things I want to look up. You know what? Oh, you said Monty Python? Okay, yeah, I should reference Monty Python. Uh, that's another like series of movies, and um, uh, there was a TV show for a while uh, that also lots of derivative jokes uh, come out of that. So Python is a reference to Monty Python. Um, and so it, the, the reason we cover Python in this class 
is because it is a general purpose programming language. In other words, you can use it for anything that you might want to program. There are also special purpose programming languages. So for example, there's a, have you ever heard of a language called R? Somebody? So R is special purpose around doing data science. Okay. The problem with R is it's not great for doing anything else. Okay. So we teach in this class a general purpose programming language so that you can have a generally useful skill, whether you pursue data science or not. Does that make sense? All right. So uh, for and then along with another language called FQL, um, which is the acronym for structured query language, are both what are called set-based programming languages. So they deal with sets well, whereas Python tends to deal with objects better. So there's a lot of differences between different programming languages. There are a lot of different programming languages. Um, people create them all the time. Okay, for very specialized purposes, a lot. Um, but usually, most people who casually program only know one language. So that's why Python is useful. Uh, people who are full time programmers are either sometimes very, very deep in one language or programming like a ton of different languages, but kind of have to look everything up every time. That's what I am. Okay, so basically, I refer to myself jokingly as a polyglot, right? I speak lots of programming languages and English, right? Um, so the fundamentals of Python is not only really, really important for this class, uh, but it's also really, really important because all programming languages, if they're in the same class, okay? So if they're general purpose programming languages, for example, or set theory languages, for example, they all use the same kind of basic constructs. So if you know how to do a thing in one language, you likely can kind of translate that very easily to another language, all right? And so we actually use uh, Python in this class, but we actually use a library it's called, so basically a set of extra tools that um, look a lot like a set theory language. So you'll actually get a smattering of both to, so that you get some basically language and understanding, right? It's that there's a lot of keywords that we use. And if you know what they kind of mean in one language, uh, they're very, uh, you know, you can use, they're the same in all the other languages uh, or mean at least the same thing. Um, the other thing that's weird about programming in general is that uh, you learn it much, much better by just doing it a lot, okay? So has anybody ever played uh, like done a musical instrument, okay? What is the one thing that they yell at you to do all the time? Practice, right? Because playing a musical instrument has a lot of similarities. The, the more you just do it, the better you get at it. And then kind of there's another level where you become really sophisticated at it, right? Which is kind of different. There's like your practice is just for the baseline. And then you get like mastery, which is something else. Um, and then the last part, and this is what's funny that people don't really realize, I think, about a lot of programmers and programming in general, is that most of us do not know how to do most things in programming languages. We Google them all the time, okay? Um, how many people here have heard of Stack Overflow and used it? Okay. Uh, see, Stack Overflow has uh, originally started as being very programming focused, but is now much wider. A friend of mine actually is like some wonkity wonk in the like photography community of Stack Overflow. Um, so yeah, so the big thing though, know, it's very difficult to ask a question if you don't know, you need a certain amount of fundamentals to be able to ask an intelligent question, right? Um, all right, any questions? All right, cool. So um, these uh, awesome graphics that I throw in the slides are to remind me to switch windows. All right, so first and foremost, as I've kind of told you before, um, that first cell, uh, we're not really gonna talk about too much, but I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about it now because it's, it's important to kind of roughly understand, but not necessarily something you need to like deal with for yourself. All right, so imagine that you are a carpenter, okay? And you have, you know, you work primarily out of your house, okay? Um, except you go to job sites, 
to do whatever carpentry things you do. At your house, in your garage, I hope, you have a whole lot of tools, right? You might have saws, you might have hammers, you might have nails, you might have whatever, right? Now, when you go to a job site, do you bring everything in the garage? No, right? What you bring is what you need for that job. Does that make sense? Right? So you know you're going to need a hammer and nails for this particular job, but you won't need a saw for whatever reason. Okay? Uh, maybe I should use a broader construction worker as my example. I don't know. But the point is, with a programming language, there is your garage full of tools but you don't want to bring them to everything that you do, okay? So what you want to do instead is just use, bring the tools you need for that particular job. Does that make sense, right? You don't want to carry all that junk if you don't have to. So whenever we say, if you see those top two lines, the import NumPy is NP and from data science import star, both of those are uh, what we call a library, but really you can think of it as, um, a let's say a, a toolbox right so we have a toolbox called data science and we have another toolbox called numpy that we bring to most of our job sites okay and so in that toolbox is going to be a bunch of different tools and then the other toolbox is a bunch of different tools but then we have literally thousands of other toolboxes in our garage that we're not going to bring with us okay that's all that's doing is getting those set up that make sense all right um, and basically, throughout this entire class, we're only going to use technically, I guess it's three toolboxes there. We have data science, we have NumPy, and we have another one called Matplotlib. All right. So, moving on. So, Python um, is one of the reasons that we use it in a class like this, and it is very popular as a very as a first programming language is because it's designed to be very readable, okay? So let's say I wanna add two numbers together and also find my cheat sheet so that I don't get lost. Sorry. All right, so let's say we want to add two numbers together. We want to add the number nine and we want to add the number two. What do you think we should type in there? Two plus nine, actually, to be consistent with my uh, cheat sheet, but I said it backwards, so. Okay, so two plus nine, right? Very readable and theoretically does what you expect when you run it. All right, so it adds the two numbers together and it gives you the result. That's all there is to it. Now, what if we want to do um, two multiplied by nine? What do you think? Any ideas? The star. What do you think? Okay. So technically, that thing is called an asterisk. Okay. Um, but uh, often nicknamed a star, uh, and that's correct. Okay. However. A lot of people might think it should look like that, right? Because that's how you would write it on paper. The letter, oh, good. We're going to have an internet connection today. Problems there. However, X is a letter and used elsewhere as a letter. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So, as a result, in 99.9% .9 of programming languages, in other words, all the ones I've ever seen, we use an asterisk, which uh, sometimes I'll just straight up refer to as a shift eight, okay? And we can just, like it said before, it can just execute it by hitting shift enter. So I won't always go to the little arrow up there. It multiplies the two numbers together. All right, so now is where it gets essentially a little, gotta find my mouse. There we go. Uh, a little trickier. Let's say I wanna do uh, two divided by 